Uh, today I'll tell you a bit about uh, quantum algorithms for matrix scaling and matrix balancing. Uh, and this talk is based on a joint work with Joran van Apeldoorn, Sander Gribling, Yinan Lee, Michael Walter, and Ronald de Wolf. Uh, and if these sound unfamiliar to you, uh, I have some pictures to make them turn them into familiar faces. So here we have Joran, uh, who is currently still at QSoft. Uh, we have Sander, who is now at IREF in France. Uh, we have Yinan, who is in Japan now. Uh, then there's me, then there's Michael and Ronald, who are still all at uh, QSoft. Okay, uh, right. So let's get to the sort of content. Uh, so I, here's a brief outline for what this talk, what the what the talk is going to be about. So first, I'll introduce the problems to you, namely the matrix scaling problem and the matrix balancing problem. Then I'll motivate these two by uh, discussing some applications and one in a bit more detail. Uh, then we'll look at some prior work uh, in the classical setting for solving these problems. And we'll introduce our results. Uh, and our results are based on a thing called Synchronous Algorithm, uh, which I'll introduce to you and I'll uh, show you how to analyze it. Uh, then I'll talk uh, about our quantum implementation of this algorithm. Uh, and at the end, I'll discuss uh, a quantum lower bound that we have also managed to prove. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish off with some outlook for future research directions. Okay. So first, let's get to these matrix scaling and matrix balancing problems. So uh, I'll mostly talk about matrix scaling. So let me start with that first. Uh, so what we're given is, uh, of course, a matrix as input. As the, type, as the name of the problem would suggest. So uh, we're given some input matrix A. Uh, and what I want to define are uh, the vectors of row marginals and column marginals of this matrix. So what these are is um, what you can do is for every row of your matrix and for every column of your matrix, you compute the sum of the entries in that row. Uh, so because our matrix doesn't have negative entries, the sum will always be positive. Uh, and we can just arrange these uh, row sums and these column sums into two vectors of length n, because our matrix has n rows and n columns. So these give you your row marginal vectors and your column marginal vectors. So these are just vectors of row sums and column sums. Now, what's the idea of matrix scaling? Or what's the goal of matrix scaling? The goal of matrix scaling is, suppose that um, I give you two vectors of length n. So some targets are in C and a precision epsilon larger than zero. Then uh, the goal is to find uh, positive diagonal matrices x and y, such that if I left multiply a by x and I right multiply a by y, then my row sums of this new matrix are approximately uh, this target r and my column sums of this new matrix are approximately this target C. Uh, so why why should you think of this? Uh, why should why is the word scaling relevant here? Well, uh, this positive diagonal matrix X uh, and Y, what they give you is they uh, give uh, they allow you to rescale the rows and columns of the matrix. So left multiplying by a positive diagonal matrix uh, rescales the rows. And right multiplying by a positive diagonal matrix rescales the columns of the matrix. So we're uh, allowed a basic set of operations, essentially, namely rescaling rows and columns. And we want to simultaneously have particular row and column sums. Uh, so of course, uh, in general, there, there's no reason to believe that this can be done exactly. So we allow for some uh, precision. And we allow for this precision, uh, or we measure this uh, imprecision in the L1 norm. So just the, the sum of differences or in absolute value. OK, then let me introduce to you. Uh, OK, so yeah, that was the remark that XAY is the matrix you can obtain from A by rescaling the row by a, a row I by XI and column J by, uh, and I see I have a typo that should say YJ. Then there's also the matrix balancing problem, which is somewhat different. Uh, 
uh, but has a very similar flavor, it turns out. Uh, so what you want to do in that case is uh, you're not given an R or a C as target, but the only thing that you want is uh, you want to find a positive diagonal matrix such that uh, if you conjugate your original matrix by this matrix, so that you look at x, a, x inverse, then uh, this new matrix has approximately equal row and column sums uh, as measured by their position epsilon. So as I said before, I will not talk much about uh, matrix balancing uh, because the matrix scaling case is somewhat easier uh, to talk about. But many of the techniques that we will use uh, in this talk also apply to matrix balancing. Okay, uh, so now we have an idea of what our problems are. But uh, you might, uh, you may very well ask, uh, why should we care about these problems, right? It seems like a sort of arcane problem and it seems like a very pure problem where you could ask what the application does this actually have. But it turns out that uh, this problem, these two problems together have very many surprising applications. Uh, so maybe the first one uh, that I really like is uh, that you can use this uh, as a preconditioner for linear system solving. So the idea here is, uh, say I'm on a computer and I want to numerically solve some linear system. Uh, then what you can do is you can try to first run one of these uh, matrix scaling or matrix balancing problems. You can apply them to your original thing. Uh, then solve the linear system, uh, then solve a slightly different linear system and then uh, return to your original linear system. And the reason that this helps you is that uh, a rescaled or rebalanced matrix may be more numerically stable. Uh, and it turns out that this is actually so useful that it's uh, done by default in LAPAC, uh, which is uh, one of the standard uh, linear algebra packages. Uh, and it's also used by MATLAB uh, by default. Okay, so these two problems, they, have a, they are actually used in practice very often. Uh, and another one, which I'll talk uh, a bit more about on the next slide, is uh, the optimal transport problem by Kantorovic and uh, Mung. Uh, okay. Then uh, it's also, for instance, related uh, the matrix scanning problem to the existence or showing uh, or what the existence of a bipartite perfect matching in a particular bipartite graph. Um, so that's related to the matrix scaling problem for the bipartite adjacency matrix. Uh, and maybe if you're slightly familiar with this, um, it's actually also related to uh, being able to, you can use these problems to approximate the permanence of a matrix. Uh, and uh, it's true that um, in a uh, bipartite graph, uh, if you look at the adja bipartite adjacency matrix, then uh, there exists a perfect matching if and only if uh, the permanent is non-zero. So the permanent is the determinant without this sign thing. Uh, and any positive contribution to the permanent uh, is actually an instance of a perfect matching. So it actually has applications for uh, sort of combinatorics things as well. Okay, uh, and then there's uh, a last one, which is actually one of the original reasons people looked at these papers uh, uh, or at these problems, namely that it can be used for maximum likelihood estimation for bivariate distributions uh, for which you actually already know what sort of the marginal distributions should be. So one of the, the largest applications in practice of this has been, uh, it's been used for instance in 1940 already uh, for, uh, working with some US census data. And uh, I think a few years before that, in 1937, there was a paper by Kreithoff, uh, so a Dutch person on telephone traffic, where he analyzed, where he uh, thought about two of these, uh, where he thought about this problem already. Okay, but uh, I mean, this list of applications turns out to not be comprehensive at all, and you can find more of them in our paper if you're interested. Oh, and uh, I forgot about this one. There is a slightly more recent paper uh, by Altschuler and Parillo, uh, which is about approximating min mean cycles in weighted graphs. And this is another application of uh, matrix balancing. Okay, so let me 
go to prior work now. Uh, oh, yes. OK. Let's first talk a bit more about uh, uh, optimal transport, uh, as I said I would. Uh, so what's the, what's the idea of this problem? Well, we're given some cost matrix C, uh, and we're given two uh, probability distributions, which we call R and C, in analogy with our uh, matrix scaling problem. And uh, what we want to do is we want to find a bivariate distribution, so uh, a n by n matrix whose entry sum to one and are all non-negative, that solves uh, the linear program uh, given by this cost matrix uh, over all distributions which have these marginal distributions R and C. So this is a problem which has uh, also also has a lot of applications. So uh, one of the oldest applications is literally optimal transport in uh, like in a physical sense, where if you have a, a number of bins or say or a, a number of piles of dirt, and you want to arrive at another uh, sort of particular configuration of dirt, uh, then you can use this cost matrix to uh, encode the distances between points. And then this distribution would tell you exactly how you would need to optimally move this dirt uh, from one sort of uh, arrangement to another arrangement. Uh, another more modern example would be uh, if you have a bunch of factories uh, producing certain goods, like vaccines, and you have a bunch of uh, locations where you want to apply these goods in a particular fashion, then uh, such a P would be um, a way of optimally moving these goods to these particular target locations. Now, what uh, happened in 2013 was that Marco Cattuti uh, wrote a paper about these problems. Uh, and what he did was he added an entropy regularization to it. So what he does is uh, he looks at a slightly different problem. So not this linear program, but a linear program with something extra, uh, with some parameter. Uh, and this parameter that we add is uh, minus the entropy of P with this uh, lambda thing here. OK, and it turns out that um, if you think uh, carefully about this new problem, uh, then actually a minimizer of this regularized problem turns out to be always a rescaling of the matrix e to the minus lambda c, uh, where we take exponentials entry-wise. Okay, so if you want to solve this new problem, which uh, is related to the original one, then you can solve a matrix scaling problem instead because you only have to find a, a, a particular rescaling of this e to the minus lambda c. Uh, and if your parameter lambda is chosen large enough, uh, then you will approximate the solution of the original LP. OK, so we can approximate optimal transport distances by scaling uh, this new matrix. And why is this important? Well, uh, the algorithms for solving these linear programs uh, they do scale sort of polynomially, but the polynomial is actually too large for actual applications, such as in machine learning and whatnot, uh, because it's like it's super quadratic. So I think it's like n to the 2.5 or n to the 3 for this particular application. Whereas uh, the sort of the data sets are too large for machine learning applications. Uh, so it turns out that actually solving matrix scaling instead is very useful. Uh, because it turns out to be something we can do fast. So I just said we can do this quickly. And now we get to the part where I tell you how quickly we can actually do this. Uh, OK. So uh, I want to make some restrictions on the input to our problem. So uh, what we take is we take some uh, matrix A. Uh, it has non-negative entries. And we want to assume that it contains uh, m non-zero entries. Uh, I, I don't know where they are, but they are somewhere. Uh, and I have some targets, r and c, which are both normalized to 1 in the L1 mode. So this is a particular choice of normalization. 
Uh, and we want to assume that our input A is actually asymptotically scalable to this RC. So that means that I can solve the matrix scaling problem for any epsilon larger than zero. So I can get arbitrarily close to my targets. So that's an assumption that we have to make. Uh, then in the classical setting, uh, this problem is quite well studied. Uh, so it turns out that for a given precision epsilon larger than zero, with these assumptions, you can find uh, such matrices X and Y that scale your matrix to uh, R and C with precision epsilon in uh, particular times. Namely, uh, the classical synchron algorithm, for instance, uh, in general, it can do this in time O tilde M divided by epsilon squared. Uh, so what this means is that uh, if, I, if I have M entries and some uh, Okay, what this means is uh, that we can do it rather quickly in terms of m, right? Because it already takes me time om to actually read the input matrix, even if I had sparse access to it. Because I'm given at least m non-zero numbers. So if I can do this uh, in time uh, m divided by epsilon squared, then I can do this rather quickly. Uh, it turns out you can do somewhat better if all your entries of your matrix are non-zero. Uh, in that case, you can reduce uh, the epsilon dependence a bit for this classical synchron algorithm. Uh, and then there are uh, much more sophisticated methods out there, classical methods, uh, which we refer to as classical second order methods. So it turns out that you can actually uh, sort of get rid of this polynomial epsilon dependence uh, and turn it into a logarithmic one over epsilon dependence. Uh, in the entry points positive case, uh, and in the general case, uh, you either have an uh, O tilde M to the 1.5 performance or an O tilde M log kappa. Uh, so I won't really explain what this log kappa means, but uh, you can think of it sort of as a diameter bound in a way. Harold? Yeah? Just to uh, double check for someone asking, um, is it true that for any fixed given A, R, and C and positive epsilon, uh, there exist X and Y, so the problem is actually solvable? Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, but what I can tell you is the following. Uh, if I give you R and C and a matrix A, then uh, whether it's asymptotically scalable or not depends not on the entries of A, but only on the support of A. So the, the way in which the particular uh, non-zero entries of A are uh, spread throughout the matrix. Uh, and just to make sure, what do you mean by asymptotically? Uh, so that means that, um, so if I can asymptotically RC scale A, then that means that for any epsilon larger than zero, I can find X and Y such that uh, X A Y is epsilon close to R and C in column and row size. Great, thank you. Thanks. OK, so this is roughly um, the classical state of the art. I mean, there's a whole zoo of other types of uh, algorithms out there. Uh, but I do want to still mention that these classical second order algorithms, while they give the best performance, uh, they rely on a very long line of work on uh, graph sparsification and Laplacian system solving algorithms. And so in particular, they're rather complicated to uh, sort of understand even. Okay, so uh, what we did in our paper is the following. Uh, what we do is we provide a quantum implementation of the synchron algorithm that I will show you. Uh, so what this, uh, what this does in terms of performance is the following. Uh, we can get a sublinear n dependence uh, in the sort of in the general case and in the entrywise positive case. So our n dependence goes down but our epsilon dependence goes up. So we have uh, some trade-off between the, the input size and the desired position. Uh, and I do have to say here that uh, we assume a quantum query access to the ent entries of the matrix, because otherwise uh, we would not have, uh, in general, we would not have time to even read out all of the classical input if we were given classical input. Harold, if I may yeah. interrupt you again, uh, I'm not sure if everyone's keeping track of the chat, but there was a 
that I think might interest others who are not looking at the chat. Um, uh, the question is, is there an efficient way to check if an input's uh, asymptotically scalable? Ah, uh, yeah, but I'm not sure if it's more efficient than uh, actually solving the problem itself. Uh, so you can reformulate the asymptotic scalability as an LP feasibility problem. So it's just checking whether a point is in a particular polytope. Uh, but uh, I mean, this will almost certainly also take time n squared. So uh, if you would just run sort of the second order algorithm, uh, then you would already be just as fast, basically with a very small epsilon. Thanks. Great question, thanks. Maybe it's good to say here that there are some easy, sufficient conditions for asymptotic scalability, like all the entries being strictly positive. Ah, yeah, that, that is indeed a great point to make. Uh, if all the entries are uh, non, uh, if all the entries are strictly positive, then it's always asymptotically scalable to any RNC. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Not for now. Okay. Then let me uh, continue. Okay, so uh, what we do with our quantum synchron algorithm is we trade off a bit of n dependence or a bit of m dependence for uh, ex extra dependence on the error uh, in the runtime. Now you might ask, is this actually uh, sort of, can you do better, right? Uh, but it turns out that we can prove a, a sort of matching lower bound, uh, which is as follows. We can prove that there exists some constant epsilon uh, larger than zero, which is independent of n, such that any quantum algorithm uh, which scales uh, matrices to uniform marginals has to make at least omega square root mn queries to the entries of A. So uh, if you think about it, so constant epsilon would mean that uh, in my Compl uh, iteration complex in my time complexity here, I put in a constant epsilon in terms of n. So then I can run, I can find it in time square root mn. And this lower bound also tells you that you can't do it any faster. Right? So in the constant uh, error regime, we have a match or matching lower bound. Okay. All right. Uh, then let me get. To the but it, of it, this. it doesn't mean that you can get rid of this epsilon dependence, like for the second row in your. Uh, yeah, that that is a, a good question. The, the right hand uh, side of well, actually the whole second row. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Wait. Can you re rephrase your question because I'm not sure I understood. Well, I mean, so the second row, this classical second order row, mm -hmm. has has a bounds that are independent of epsilon. Uh, well, they're they're logarithmic in epsilon, but oh, okay. oh yeah, well you have sort of hidden them, I guess, in your yeah, old tilde right. notation, and, and your lower bound, uh, but your lower bound actually only shows it for a fixed epsilon. So it could still be a quantum algorithm that is faster than the second row, and that's also in in I mean, and and that's yeah. independent of epsilon, or. Uh... Or did you solve this as well? That's uh, no, we didn't solve this. And uh, I, I will tell you at the end, sort of, what, this is also one of the possible future research directions. Okay. So we would be interested in finding either a lower bound, which also has an epsilon dependence in, in some regime, which is somewhat stronger than this. Uh, or we would be interested in finding a quantum algorithm, which can actually uh, also have a logarithmic one over epsilon dependence and a sublinear uh, dependence on that or a, like a, a lower than two. Well, basically that improves the, the second yeah. row. Yeah, that's right. We, we, we don't know at this point. Okay. Uh, and there's still work to be done there. <laughs> Good. Okay, then let me get to the meat of this talk, uh, which is synchronous algorithm. So uh, I've, I've mentioned synchronous algorithm a bit, uh, and you might think that because I've mentioned it a couple of times and said nothing about it so far, that it might be a very difficult algorithm, but it turns out that it's actually not. Um, so let me remind you what the goal of our matrix scaling problem is. So our goal is to find positive diagonal matrices X and Y 
such that our row sums are equal to some particular uh, prescribed values and our column sums are equal to some particular prescribed values. Okay. So the operations that we're allowed to do are rescaling rows and rescaling columns. But I want to achieve particular row sums and particular column sums, right? So if I want to solve half of this problem, then it's very easy because I can just fix the row sums to be what my targets are. But the problem is this disturbs the column sums, okay? So after I fix the row sums, I can fix the column sums, but then I've changed the row sums again, right? So now what I can do is I can try to fix the row sums again, but then I change the column sums again, so I have to fix them. So Synchron's algorithm is basically this process of fixing half of the problem iteratively. Uh, and what you can do is you can return as soon as you have your achieved your desired precision. And now the really, really surprising thing here is that it actually converges whenever A is asymptotically scalable to this to these particular targets R and C. So uh, no matter what position you want, if you just alternate between fixing the rows and the columns, then you will achieve it at some point. And I'll explain to you why this is true. But first, we go do an example to get some feel for why uh, or why this works. Okay, so say that my target marginals R and C are uh, both uh, are two are vectors of length two, and I want uh, them to uh, all entries to be one. So what I want is that my row sums and my column sums are all one. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to rescale to a doubly stochastic matrix. Uh, okay. Then uh, what we can do is I can take some matrix uh, given by this A. Uh, so it's, its entries are 13, 26, 1 third, and 0. Okay, so that this looks like a sort of a weird starting example. But then I, I do one iteration, namely I fix the rows. Okay, so how do I fix the rows? Well, I compute the first row sum. Uh, the first row sum is 39. And I want to uh, have a row sum of one, so I divide by 39. And in the second row, I compute the row sum, it's one third, but I want the row sum to be one, so I divide by one third. Okay, so we end up with the matrix uh, one third, two thirds, one, zero. Okay, and you can check uh, this matrix is not, uh, it doesn't have column sums one, right? Because our first column sum is four thirds and our second column sum is two thirds. So we fix this. We compute the column sums, divide by them, and then uh, you end up at this matrix one fourth, one, three fourths, zero. Okay, but now the, the row sums are again not uh, one exactly. So you can iterate this process. And uh, it turns out that after 2t steps, you can write down a closed form for this particular example. Uh, the first entry would be 1 over 2t, so this is very small. Uh, the second entry is 1. The third entry is 2t minus 1 divided by 2t. And the last entry is 0. So this is very close to having row and column sums 1, right? Because the first row is something like almost 1. Second row is almost 1. And first and second columns are also almost one as well. Okay, so this was a, a, a good example for Synchron. Uh, but you could say, well, I mean, uh, you made this presentation, so surely you would have picked an example that worked. Uh, but it turns out to actually work in general. And I'll explain to you roughly why it works in general uh, without sort of actually doing all of the details. Uh, so to get our complexity for our uh, synchron algorithm, what we have to do is we have to find, uh, we have to do two things. So we want to bound the number of iterations for which we will proceed via a potential argument. Uh, and we want to bound, uh, or we want to get, implement these iterations in a particular uh, time complexity. Okay, so the first thing I will discuss is the uh, bounding the number of iterations. Uh, 
So I said, uh, we will do this via a potential argument. And one of the key ingredients of a potential argument is writing down a potential. And the potential that we use for this particular argument will be the following potential. So it's a function of our uh, scaling matrices X and Y. Uh, so we have our X as input, our Y as input. And what we uh, have as output is the following. We have the sum of all the entries of our rescaled matrix. Uh, so this is the sort of the sum of entries of X, A, Y. Uh, and we have not just this, but what we actually do is we subtract sort of two correction terms. Uh, so for each row, we have a term uh, ri log xi. And for each column, we have a uh, term uh, cj log yj. So on its own, this expression doesn't tell you anything interesting about this potential. But it has a couple of nice properties which should tell you that it can be useful for matrix scaling. The first of which is uh, the function is actually a convex function in X and Y. So uh, why is it? Why is this true? Well, uh, the first term is a bi is, it's a bilinear term in X and Y, so it should definitely be convex. Uh, and then for the other terms, we have a minus a logarithm, which is a convex function. Uh, and here also for, for the Y terms, we also have a minus a logarithm. So you can see this is a convex function in X and Y. Uh, what's more important, or what's equally important, uh, is the following property. It turns out that the gradient of this potential function is exactly zero if and only if your matrix is exactly RC scaled. So if your column sums and your row sums are exactly right. So how do you see this? Well, the gradient is defined by differentiating with respect to your variables. So let's do that for one variable. If I uh, differentiate my potential with respect to xi, then what you get is from the first term, uh, you pick out all the terms where an xi was. Uh, so that leaves you with uh, the sum over j, ai, j, yj. And then uh, from the leftover terms, if you differentiate this with respect to xi, the only thing you're left over is ri divided by xi. So you can ask yourself, when is this derivative zero? Well, it's zero if and only if ri is exactly equal to xi times the sum of aij, yj. But this last sum is actually the, the row sum, uh, the i for row sum of the matrix xay. So this derivative is zero if and only if our, uh, the i row sum of x, a, y is exactly equal to our target. Okay, so this implies that the, the gradient is zero if and only if we're exactly RC scale. And if you know this potential, if you've written it down, then uh, actually it turns out you can view the Sinkhorn algorithm as uh, a coordinate descent algorithm, where first you do, uh, where first you optimize your convex function over the first n coordinates, then over the second n coordinates, then over the first again, etc. You alternate between these two, uh, and sort of the the convexity of this function tells you that you are allowed to hope that coordinate descent uh, sort of does the job. Okay, so we have a good reason to believe that Synchron could actually work now, right? Because we're trying to minimize this function. Uh, the minimizer corresponds exactly to uh, exact scalings for our matrix. And our algorithm does a sort of coordinate descent along this function. So this makes it very plausible that Synchron would actually work. Okay, so let's get to the sort of somewhat more technical part. Uh, so to make this formal, that this actually does work, you have to do, uh, you have to add two more ingredients. So we had our potential, but we have to say something intelligent, intelligent about this potential. Namely, we have to give a potential bound, uh, which I'll explain in a bit, and a progress bound. Uh, okay, so what is a potential bound for this? Well, uh, a potential bound 
in general, it's uh, you start at a certain potential and you want to uh, lower bound the gap between your starting potential and the minimum possible potential so that uh, sort of you can un you understand this gap between your starting potential and the minimum possible potential. So uh, this is uh, sort of in this particular case, we can give a potential bound of the following form. Uh, if all non-zero entries of our matrix are at least some number mu larger than zero, and our matrix is uh, normalized in one norm, so this means all of its entries sum to one, uh, then this potential gap is bounded by a number, namely log one over mu. So this means that the, uh, we can uh, at most decrease our potential further by log one over mu during the algorithm. Okay, and this is actually a nice potential bound because uh, our entries will typically, well, we will assume them to be sort of not so small, so like polynomially small in n, uh, or polynomially large at most in n, or small, yeah, small. Uh, so log one over mu is sort of a small quantity. Okay, so this is what we call a potential bound. And now we get to the part where we have a progress bound, which is, does our, uh, do our iterations of our, actually, uh, of our algorithm actually decrease our potential by a certain amount? Because if we can control the starting gap, and if our algorithm always decreases our potential by a little bit, then we can use this to bound the number of iterations. Okay, so what we do is, the, uh, what it turns out happens is the following. If you make an exact update, so if you use sort, sort of real or uh, infinite precision arithmetic, uh, then you can write out exactly what the change in the potential is. And it turns out that this change in potential after you update your X and Y, uh, if you update your X or your Y, uh, if you happen to update, say, the roads, then your potential decreases by a kullback leibler divergence, also known as a relative entropy. Uh, and in this case, it's the relative entropy between your current row marginals and your target row marginal. So recall that these are probability distributions, uh, at least throughout the run of the algorithm. Uh, okay, so this uh, this kullback leibler, leibler divergence, you can think of it as a sort of distance measure or a distance metric. It's not actually a metric, but you can think of it that way. Um, and uh, we can actually relate it to the L1 error of our matrix uh, of our, in our uh, scaling. Uh, you can prove that if your matrix is not epsilon scaled, so if either the row sums are far away or uh, the column sums are far away, uh, more than epsilon far away, then you make epsilon squared progress uh, up to some constants. Okay, so this uh, follows from something known as Pinsker's inequality. Okay, so if you have these two ingredients, then you know, okay, I have a certain amount of potential I can at most decrease by, and I know that as long as my, as long as my matrix is not epsilon scaled, then I decrease it by epsilon squared. So that tells me I can go for at most log one over mu divided by epsilon squared iterations. So therefore, I must, my algorithm must return within this number of iterations, okay? So this is the way that we bound uh, the, the number of iterations. And I should mention that uh, sort of the, the form of this analysis and this particular potential, they're all widely used in uh, analyzing matrix scaling algorithms. Uh, and this convex function is also the basis for some of these uh, sophisticated second order methods. Okay, so we've analyzed the number of iterations now. So let me drink some water. Okay, we've said something about the number of iterations that we need to make, but we haven't said anything, of, uh, anything yet about how to actually do these, imp uh, how to implement these iterations which is where we get to the quantum part of this talk. So what do we have to do in every iteration? Well, uh, each iteration, uh, we test if our matrix is epsilon scaled 
or not. Uh, and otherwise, we have to compute uh, sort of the new row rescalings or the new column rescalings, right? Because we want to compute these, uh, like the, the new X and Y matrices. So what are the expensive operations uh, in implementing this? Well, uh, the expensive operations turn out to be sort of only computing the row and column sums of this rescaled matrix, right? So what I have to do is for every row, I have to compute the sum of n numbers. But this is a deceptively simple task. Uh, so classically, this uh, we can do this very efficiently. We can do it in time O tilde n. Uh, and I wrote a tilde here because I'm sort of ignoring that you have to use finite precision arithmetic. Uh, and quantumly, so on a quantum computer, we can actually do something slightly different. Uh, instead of sort of using sort of standard addition rules and multiplication and whatnot uh, to compute these things, what we can do is uh, we can find a multiplicative approximation of these row and column sums with some particular time uh, complexity. Namely, we can find a one plus minus delta multiplicative approximation of these sums uh, within time O tilde uh, square root n divided by delta. Uh, so let me recall to you how you can do this. Uh, so this is actually just a generalization of quantum approximate counting, uh, if you like. So what you do is uh, you assume you're given binary access on the uh, binary query access to a vector. Uh, so like you're, you're given uh, query access to a fixed point numbers of a vector uh, of length n, let's call it v. Uh, for simplicity, we assume that it has at least one large entry, uh, but you can also pre-process by uh, first finding the largest entry of this matrix and then uh, using quantum maximum finding and then dividing by it. Uh, and the idea is then to prepare uh, this particular quantum state, uh, this particular state psi, uh, by first preparing a uniform superposition over these indices uh, and then performing a number of controlled rotations to actually get uh, sort of the squared vjs and squared minus vjs in terms of, uh, in front of the get zero and get one parts. And then the idea is to use amplitude estimation to find a uh, one plus minus delta multiplicative estimate of the squared amplitude of the part of psi ending in zero. So uh, if you expand this, uh, what this means, then you get exactly that this is uh, the sum of uh, Vj divided by n. So this would be the average entry, uh, the average of the entries of the vector V. Okay, but if we can find multiplicative estimates uh, of the mean of a, of a, a list of numbers, then we can just multiply this by n, and then we have computed the sum. Okay. Uh, so for the sort of for getting this particular runtime, you do need to assume that this largest entry is at least one half, because otherwise the amplitude of this uh, get zero part is too small uh, before you put it into amplitude estimation. So here we leverage the fact that we have binary access to these numbers, and not just uh, we're not just given this state. OK, so basically, the tool that we really use is amplitude estimation, or just a quantum approximate summation. So if we want to use this particular subroutine, this quantum subroutine, to actually implement our algorithm uh, with some particular precision delta, then we have to figure out, uh, then uh, we can do this uh, in quantum time, approximately O tilde n times uh, square root n divided by delta. Okay, but I haven't chosen delta here yet. So we need to figure out what delta can we choose that makes our algorithm still works, right? Because we, we only make a certain amount of potential and you could think that if you have very imprecise updates, then you could actually just be undoing something you did in the previous iteration. So we have to figure out what, what choice of delta uh, do we need. And it could also be that our delta has to be so small 
say, if delta has to be one over n, then we're dead in the water and we can't do re really do use this to get any faster uh, than classical. Because then our, uh, our quantum time would already be larger than a classical time. So in a sense, we have to get lucky here. Uh, and it turns out that we do. OK. So as I've just said, imprecise updates, they make less progress in our potential. Right? Previously, I assumed I had perfect arithmetic. So we proved a nice lemma, uh, which is actually sort of the, somehow the, the most important result. Uh, namely, if we use delta multiplicative approximations for computing these sums, then in every iteration that we weren't uh, already epsilon scaled, we still make epsilon squared minus delta progress per iteration. So uh, what you can get from this is, well, OK, I want, I want this to be uh, at least something. I want it to be positive, at least, because I don't want to make backwards progress. Uh, so what is a good choice of delta? Well, if I just pick delta is 1 half epsilon squared, then I'm completely then everything is completely fine. Uh, and the reason this is completely fine is because I still make the same order of progress in every iteration, even using imprecise updates. Uh, and if you use uh, one half, then you know your number of iterations, it will just double because you make half the progress in every iteration. OK, so this is uh, what we know now. Uh, our number of iterations doesn't really go up because we use imprecise updates. So we're happy and we collect uh, complexities. Uh, so our time per iteration with this particular choice of delta will be uh, O tilde n to the 1.5 divided by epsilon squared. And we have sort of O tilde 1 over epsilon squared iterations. Uh, so I'm ignoring the log 1 over mu because it's something small anyway. Uh, so in fact, our total time for our algorithm will just be O tilde n to the 1.5 divided by epsilon to the 40. Uh, if there are any questions, this is probably a good point to ask them. Uh, I'll, in the meantime, I'll drink some water. OK, uh, since it seems there are no questions, let me it gets to uh, some other things. So of course, uh, within a presentation, I within a presentation of an hour, I cannot present all of the uh, nitty gritty details of our paper. Uh, so it turns out that, uh, for instance, you have to work quite hard uh, to actually make sure that finite precision arithmetic is OK everywhere. Um, so some of the problems that appear are, for instance, uh, these matrices x and y. Uh, they can become exponentially large or small in n and epsilon. So if we use fixed point arithmetic, we don't really have time to write them down explicitly. Um, so the way that you avoid this is uh, by storing the logarithms of these, uh, of these diagonal entries. Uh, but it turns out that then you have also have to worry about a lot of intermediary arithmetic operations and the precision that you need for them. Uh, so this sort of every page becomes twice as long because you have to worry about finite precision arithmetic everywhere. Uh, OK. Then uh, some other points are, uh, if our matrix has only positive entries, then it turns out you can actually uh, do a somewhat better analysis than this potential, uh, potential argument that I showed you here uh, to reduce the number of iterations by a factor of uh, 1 over epsilon. So you get a slightly better epsilon uh, dependence if all entries are uh, positive. Uh, and it's also nice that uh, this algorithm actually does adapt to sort of a sparse access model rather than a dense matrix access model. OK. So uh, I said I won't talk much, much about matrix balancing. Uh, this is roughly the only thing I'll say about it. Um, there is a uh, variant or something that looks a bit like Sinkhorn's algorithm, which is called Osborne's algorithm. Uh, so uh, it has a very similar flavor and it achieves almost the same thing. 
so what we want is, uh, so what we do in the paper is we uh, make a quantum version of a randomized variant of this uh, Osborne's algorithm, which is a classical algorithm. So for the experts in the audience who, who know roughly what Osborne's algorithm should mean, uh, th there's a bit of a warning here, which is that our analysis is much more involved than it would be in the classical setting. Uh, and the reason is that uh, sort of the only uh, we can only update uh, in a randomized fashion uh, one uh, row or column in every iteration. So in particular, within one iteration, we no longer have time to test uh, whether our matrix is epsilon balanced or epsilon scaled. Uh, so this is it made me looks like a technical thing, uh, and it is a very technical thing. Uh, but the problem is now that you can't return anymore as soon as you are epsilon skill. So you have to somehow get around this. Uh, and we do this in the paper. And we also uh, analyze a, a randomized quantum variant of Synchron's algorithm in the same way. Uh, and the same warning applies here. OK. Then let me get to the lower bounds part. Uh, so I previously announced that we would have a omega square root mn lower bound for a constant error matrix scaling. So I'll briefly sketch for you how this reduction goes. Um, so what we re we reduce matrix scaling to a, a sort of combinatorical problem, uh, which we can analyze using the adversary bound. Namely, re we reduce it to learning a permutation modulo two. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, if I give you a permutation of uh, n elements, then learning a permutation modulo two uh, is the same as finding a string, uh, a bit string uh, of length n, such that z i is equal to uh, sigma i modulo two. So what the information that's here is uh, for every i is sigma i odd or even. Right? So you don't have to learn sigma i for every i. You don't have to learn the explicit indices. You only have to learn the parity of each uh, output value. And it turns out that with uh, a quantum adversary bound, uh, you can prove that it takes uh, at least omega n square root n queries uh, to this permutation sigma, with the catch that these queries are of the form, is sigma i equal to j? And the reason that this particular query type is important is because if I could just query uh, what is sigma of i, then within time, uh, then within linear time, I could find the parity of each output value because I can just query the output value and then compute the parity for each input value. Okay, so there's a good reason for this to take more than uh, linear time. So how do we relate this to matrix scaling? So we first take a permutation and we sort of look at the permutation matrix instead. Um, so if you think about the associated permutation matrix, uh, then our queries that are of this form are actually queries of the form uh, is a particular matri uh, element of the matrix uh, one or zero. So it's uh, sort of is pij equal to one or zero for each entry. So these are the queries we can make. Uh, what we show is that there exists sort of two by two gadget matrices such that um, uh, b0 and b1, such that uh, we can uh, sort of take, uh, we can take a byte or a bit, so a zero or one uh, and if, if you're given either B0 or B1 and you scale it to uniform marginals, so one of, so all entries uh, or all row sums and column sums one half, then you can learn from the scaling uh, matrices for this BB, you can learn what B was. So what you can do is you can use this to encode bits in matrix scaling solutions. So solutions to the matrix scaling problem. So what we do now is combine these two things. 
uh, we have a matrix. It's a zero of uh, it's a zero, of a zero one matrix, namely our permutation matrix. And all the ones we replace by one of these gadgets, and we replace each gadget by b zero or b one, depending on uh, which row it's in. So if it's in an odd row, then we replace it by uh, b one, and if it's in an even row, then we replace it by b zero. So it turns out you can use this structure, uh, sort of the, the overall structure of this matrix now, uh, to prove that if you can uh, epsilon scale or epsilon scale for some constant epsilon, uh, a matrix A of this form, then you can learn the original permutation or the, the parity of the output uh, or learn the permutation modulo two. And therefore you must take at least omega n square root n queries. And to actually get the announced lower bound of uh, omega square root mn, you have to use some fancy uh, composition theorems for quantum query lower bounds uh, in the sparse set. OK, uh, so I think that's about it for content. So now we get to uh, some future research uh, directions and outlook. Uh, so I mentioned that there is a very large list of applications. Uh, so one could wonder, are there specialized quantum algorithms which also give speed ups for these applications? So some of these are very would be very straightforward, namely, for instance, the approximating optimal transport distances, because the only thing you have to do there is uh, rescale a matrix. But for some of these other ones, these things are not so clear. Uh, then there is also uh, interest in uh, generalizations of uh, the matrix scaling and matrix balancing problems, such as operator scaling. So you can think of operator scaling as a sort of a quantum version of matrix scaling, which is always nice. Uh, and one could be interested in uh, sort of trying to find quantum algorithms for solving these problems as well. Then there is a, a sort of two possible future research directions that uh, Harry already sort of pointed out in the prior work section. Namely, uh, we have this uh, row in the prior work section, which said you can also do sort of almost linear time uh, classically. So it's basically just reading the input and then running a very sophisticated algorithm. Uh, and this one had a log one over epsilon dependence in terms of the error. So you could wonder, can we actually find a quantum algorithm, which also has a logarithmic one over epsilon dependence, and is also uh, has a lower uh, n dependence than uh, we can achieve classically. On the other hand, it could be true that this is actually uh, not the case, uh, and that we can actually prove a somewhat strict, uh, stronger lower bound, where Buddha, we would also have a polynomial epsilon dependence uh, in some parameter region. OK. Uh, so I think this was my last slide. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>